picks uh, assigned some topics to share this weekend. And uh, this afternoon, I was asked if I'd speak on two different things. So I'll, I'll speak once and we'll have a break and then I'll speak again. And the first uh, topic, and Andy's the one who's, who sent me my assignments. Uh, <laughs> first topic is, uh, has to do with living a principled life. And uh, the other one has to do with uh, avoiding idolatry in, in this world and in our Christian lives. Because idolatry actually is uh, still a phenomenon, even though we don't have statues, generally speaking, that we bow down to and mistake them for gods. Uh, there's still plenty of idolatry in the human fallen heart and in the religious heart. I mean, the, frankly, it's religious people more than others who tend toward uh, wanting to worship deities uh, or worship something. And uh, so there's many distractions from the simple and pure worship of God. So we'll be talking about those things. Uh, right now, I want to talk about uh, the principled life. Now, the principled life is the title of uh, one of my lectures at uh, at the website under, under, the, head, under the series called uh, Cultivating Christian Character. And being principled means that you have certain principles that guide your life, and they are established fundamental um, perimeters in your life that you've established and that which you will not violate, at least not very often. If you violate them, you, it's because you didn't want to and because you were weak or foolish or something. But you have principles uh, that you live by, that you believe you must and should live by. And, I, and there are such principles, of course. And we have uh, examples of many heroes in the Bible whose character and their principles, they were usually pretty good at maintaining even when they were... Uh, in situations where you might not expect a man to be very strong. When we think of Joseph, especially in Egypt, here's a man who was raised in a somewhat godly home. His brothers weren't very godly, but uh, he was the, almost the youngest son of a large family, and, his, uh, and he had a conscience toward God. He had principles. And he was sold into slavery by his brothers into a foreign country and raised to uh, a position of trust in the home of his master Potiphar, and uh, Joseph was a young man, 17 years old, uh, handsome, we're told, I'm sure very virile, and his master's wife took a liking to him. And I'm sure that she was probably an attractive woman. She was married to a political official, um, and a lot of times political officials like to have eye candy for their escort for their, their wives, even if they don't have very good women for wives sometimes. And sometimes the wives are better than the men. But uh, in, in this case, this wife was worse. This wife was uh, not faithful to her husband. She was attracted to Joseph. He was in the household as a slave. He was not really free to leave. Now, many times if you're working at a job and somebody there is trying to seduce you and you're very determined to stay pure, you may just want to quit your job and find another job. Joseph didn't have that option. He was a slave. He was owned. He'd been purchased. He was part of the household furniture. And therefore, he was not free to leave. And the, and the pressure did not let up because every time he turned around, she tried to uh, seduce him. Now, we know he, he resisted successfully. And he, she falsely accused him, of course. And he was put in prison for it. It's interesting because here's a young man who is in a pagan country the entire culture around him is pagan. Like a, a Christian kid, 17 years old, in a totally worldly high school situation, or completely uh, worldly city with no other Christians, no fellowship, no one to keep him accountable. You know, a lot of people say, well, you need an account accountability partner to keep you honest. Well, not if you have character, apparently, because Joseph didn't have anyone keeping him accountable except his conscience, except God. And he had principles. And when the woman tried to seduce him, uh, and she actually grabbed him physically, eventually and tried to drag him into the bedroom, and he'd left his robe behind and ran off and, let, and escaped. Uh, first he said, you know, my master has put me in charge of everything in the household. <clears throat> everything he has, he's put under my charge except you. And he says, how can I do this thing and sin against God? And he fled. 
It's interesting that he said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? Because the way he began to set that statement up, you'd think he'd say, how can I sin against my master? Because he said, my master's been good to me, my master trusts me, my master has, in, has given me every privilege, he's put everything under my hand, how can I betray him and, and do what you're asking me to do? But he didn't say that. He said, how can I, he set it all up that way, and then he said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? Now this is very wise, because a person to maintain principles in a circumstance like he was in would have to have a conscience toward God. If he didn't have a conscience toward God, if he was just thinking, well, I like my master, he's good to me, I don't want to hurt his feelings, I don't want to do wrong to him, there's always a way the devil could whisper into his head, well, yeah, he's not, it's not going to hurt your master any. He won't, he'll never know about it, you know? He's busy in the office all the time. He's not paying attention to his wife. That's why she's after you, you know? She's not satisfied, and he's, they probably don't have much of a relationship. He, you know, if, what he doesn't know won't hurt him. <coughs> I mean, the devil could say all those things, and when a young man is very much drawn uh, toward, toward being seduced, almost any excuse is good enough to get him to cave in in most cases. But this guy, he, he knew that if he was only thinking about his duty to his master, which was a significant duty, I mean, it would be a tremendous betrayal of his master's trust. But more than that, if, if you're only thinking about your answerableness to other men, if, if only other men are keeping you accountable, <clears throat> It's not enough. You won't be able to maintain principles uh, uh, in a time of great temptation. I know that there was a, uh, a church I attended in Oregon for a while where they put a very strong emphasis on the need for everyone to have accountability um, excuse me, to the elders or to some small group leader or something like that. They wanted everyone to be very accountable. And it turned out that one of the most honored and respected elders became exposed that he had been conducting affairs with two of the women in the church for eight years secretly <clears throat> and, he, and he was in an accountability group you know and it just when that happened it just told me you know if a person isn't accountable in their conscience toward God no amount of human structured accountability is going to keep you honest you can always fool people hide it from people you can't hide it from God a principled person <clears throat> is one who sticks to his principles because he fears God and uh, that was clearly Joseph's situation. It's interesting that Joseph exhibited such character consistently because uh, when he was in Potiphar's house, he came in as an ordinary slave. But he won the confidence of Potiphar just because he was competent and honest and clearly had integrity. And so Potiphar raises him to a position. And when, when Potiphar came home and his wife accused Joseph of having attempted to rape her, which is a total fabrication, but she did have Joseph's coat in her hand as, you know, exhibit A. It says Potiphar was very angry, and he threw Joseph in prison. Now, who was he angry at? If he was angry at Joseph, he would have had him killed. It's interesting that Joseph was put in prison and actually given some favorable treatment in prison. And yet, I personally think that Potiphar knew his wife's character very well, and he knew Joseph's character very well. And I think what made him angry was that he could not legitimately ignore his wife's complaint, even though he didn't believe her. He could not favor a slave over a free woman in that society. That would be unthinkable. I think Potiphar was angry because he realized he's losing his best servant. I mean, this guy Joseph, he's, you know, Potiphar has prospered under, this, under Joseph's stewardship of his household. I think he's kicking himself. Like, now I'm going to have to lose this servant because my wife did this again. You know, or something. You know, I don't know how many times she did it, but he certainly knew his wife and Joseph well enough to know that Joseph was innocent. And if he didn't think so, he would have had him hung. There's no way Joseph would have gotten out of that situation alive if his master really believed that he'd try to rape his wife. So, I mean, it's interesting that Joseph, even under, under accusation, I'm pretty sure his master knew his character, that he was a consistent man of character. When Joseph was put in prison... The, the, the overseer of the prison soon recognized his integrity and his competence and made him put him over all the prisoners so that he was managing the whole prison under the, under the official of the government who was running it. And then when he was exalted out of prison, where was it put? At the top of the whole country, under Pharaoh only. I mean, this is what... It's hard to find honest help. It's hard to find... 
And I, I've never hired people, but I know people who do hire, and they say, boy, is it hard to find people that you can just set them loose on a project, and they're not going to cheat you, they're not going to come in late, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to lie about the hours they've worked. I mean, they're, you can just trust them. And when you find someone like that, you want to hold on to them, you want to you find more of those. Uh, and Joseph was that kind of person, whether he's in Potiphar's house or in the prison or even uh, in the government under Pharaoh. And a man's character makes a way for him. And, and what character is, is having principles that govern your behavior rather than convenient uh, convenience. Uh, most people are, are somewhat lazy about their uh, ethics. And they even know that they want to be honest people. They want to, you know, they don't want to cheat on their wives. They don't want to rob or they don't want, they don't want to be dishonest. But if it's easy enough to do and to get away with it, or if there's a big enough payoff, or if there's suffering to be had for sticking to your principles, most people will choose convenience first. There aren't many heroes left who will you know, stick to their guns, like the martyrs you know, in the early church. You know, they're told, all you have to do is burn incense to Caesar and you won't get fed to the lions. You won't be burned at the stake. You won't get your head cut off. And, and there were some who caved in in those days. There were people they called lapses who, under that kind of pressure, they, they surrendered their principles. Now, they had principles. They, they were Christians. They were followers of Christ at a time when it was not easy to be a follower of Christ. And yet some of them gave up Christ when it, when it was going to cost too much to keep their principles. But the ma vast majority of Christians that were put in that position in the second, third century actually stuck to their guns. They just said, I'm not going to burn incense to Nero. He's not the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. And they went ahead to their deaths, sometimes very horrible deaths. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you find what principled lives look like in the ultimate test. But we aren't tested like that very often in our, in our society, not yet. And, uh, and yet we cave in under much less. You know, some, I heard a preacher say once a long time ago, Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Lots of Christians say betray him for a lot less than that. You know, a lot less payoff than 30 pieces of silver people betray Christ. And th this is something we need to make sure that we don't become a statistic like that. And we are living at a time with many statistics. Some of them are pastors of big churches on television. Uh, I mean, everyone knows a story or two or three about somebody who was some kind of a moral or, or religious uh, spokesperson. They might have been a, a religious, a Christian leader on TV, or they might have been some you know, conservative politician who is speaking up for family values or something, then they get caught uh, totally compromised. Now, were these people total hypocrites? I suspect not. I don't know any of these people personally, and it's not necessary to assume they were complete hypocrites. They may have been really people who wanted to be good people, who really wanted to be Christians, who really wanted to, to promote righteousness. But we live at a time where there's tremendous pressure to compromise, to cave in, to lie, to cheat. Uh, and only those who have principles, like Joseph had, are really going to stand against. We have to live a, a life based on principles and not ever succumb to convenience. I, I don't like to expose too much about myself, but when I, got, when I was 19, I got married. And I was faithfully married, and I was a Christian. I was in the ministry when I got married. And my wife was a professing Christian, too. And we had a baby the next year, and then the next year she ran off with someone else. And uh, never looked back. She gave up the Lord. She was an atheist last I heard. And, uh, and she didn't wait to leave before she began to have affairs. She had affairs before she left, and then she ran off with one of them. So I was aware of this for some time before she left. We were only married for two years before she ran off, but in that two years there were a number of affairs that I became aware of. And I realized that you know, that biblically speaking, as I understand the Bible, I had grounds for divorce. And it was hard to stay in that marriage because, I, frankly, I wasn't getting any love there. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I was supporting her, but she was uh, really 
available to everyone but me. But the, the thing is that, and I'm not, I don't mean that to put her down. I mean, there's not much I could say to yeah. elevate her, but uh, though I cared for her. Um, but the point is, that I, I often thought, you know, that it's hard in a marriage with someone like this. I had no idea that she'd eventually leave me and divorce me, but I knew I could divorce. But I also knew that I made vows. And, you know, even if I could justify uh, divorce my wife, I couldn't, I mean, I might be able to justify it biblically, I couldn't justify it to my own principles, mm -hmm. to my own conscience. Because I had said when I made vows that I will cleave only to her for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. This was worse, yeah. but that was already written into the vows. Mm -hmm. You know, for richer or for poorer, mm -hmm. in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. That's assuming she would do the same. But the, the point is, I just thought, well, I can either stay in this fairly miserable situation uh, and keep my integrity, or I can get out of this, take the, take the exit that the Bible itself seems to allow, and, and feel that I've compromised on the vows I took. And, um, and so I stayed. And I, as far as I know, if she hadn't run off, I'd still be with her today and probably still be very frustrated. <laughs> but the point is, I thought, well, life is short and eternity is long. And I want to live by principles that will be a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, and a million years from now. I'll look back on the decision I made today under pressure and temptation and say, I held to my principles. Uh, and it's hard at the time to stick with your principles because the world is full of traps and full of temptations and it's full of tests. And what you're being tested on many times are your Christian principles. Will you trust God? Will you love God? Will you be faithful to God? Uh, this is what we're tested in. And, and only as we have a firm grip immovably on the principles that we've, uh, that we've adopted as Christians uh, will we not be moved. <clears throat> Because we will be moved if we if we if we have any way of being moved. If if you have any price for which you would sell out your principles, the devil knows that price. He'll pay. He'll pay for it, uh, and you'll and you'll be moved. You have to be a person who cannot be moved. Another person like this in the Bible, of course, is Daniel, who's also a very young man, probably in his late teens, or if not his mid-teens, when he was carried away into Babylon. Very similar situation to Joseph's. They were. They're both taken against their will from a, a religious home, a religious environment, into a totally pagan land where, where there's essentially no accountability. I mean, if Joseph had slept with Potiphar's wife, no one probably would have found out. And if they did, they'd probably think, oh, well, that goes on all the time. Just like people would think today in that situation. I'm sure Egypt was even more corrupt than America today, and probably ba certainly Babylon was too, I would think. And therefore, Compromise would be very easy to do because there wouldn't there'd be almost no public opprobrium uh, heaped upon you for for living a pagan way. And when when uh, Daniel came into Babylon, he realized that there were things that he, as a Jew, could not eat that would be served at the Babylonian tables. And he was in the he was kind of in the government circles. He was in a special group of people who were trained for like government service. And he was trained in the language of the Babylonians, and, he, and the, you know, he was treated quite well. But he knew that the food they served him, some of it was probably meat sacrificed to idols, but they're commonplace in pagan lands. A lot of it was probably pork or, or other kinds of food that a Jew could not in good conscience eat. And we have a really important verse, and I'll tell you, when I was a young man, this verse just jumped at, out of the page at me when I was reading Daniel one time. Um, and it's been a very important verse in this very connection that we're talking about. It's in Daniel chapter 1, right at the very beginning, when he and his three friends are, find themselves in the Babylonian uh, culture, facing the many temptations to compromise, I'm sure. It says in Daniel 1 and verse 8, it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. 
Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He actually asked that he could have a, a, a separate, a different diet, actually a more a humbler diet. So he's not asking for special privileges. He's actually saying, how about if we, you just bring the vegetable dishes to us and leave the meat out? Uh, <clears throat> but it's interesting, he said, and I think this is a very important way this is written. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. He had principles as a Jewish boy, and he purposed in his heart. What does that mean? I realize that many Christians I know succumb to various temptations, even though when they don't want to. Even when they've decided, I don't want to do that anymore. That's something I did before as a Christian. As a Christian, I don't believe in that anymore. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to obey God. And yet they find themselves succumbing far more often than they'd like to think. And a lot of times I've had to ask people, and myself too, because I've, I've had the same problem in my life too. You know, I have to say, is the reason that I succumb simply because I've never purposed in my heart that I will never do such a, and such a thing? It's one thing to say, I don't want to do this. I think I won't do this. Uh, God helping me, I, 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 I'm not going to do this. Uh, it's nothing to say, I have purposed in my heart. My heart, I have consciously decided <clears throat> the door is closed to that kind of activity. Um, I, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm that way about marriage. The marriage vows I made to my first wife, uh, I, I purposed in my heart. I'm not going to violate those vows, no matter what. And, of course, I didn't, but... <laughs> But, but the marriage ended anyway against my wishes. But I've, I've been married since. I'm married now. And I uh, have a very wonderful wife. And uh, I, I know her character and her principles, so I know that you know, it's never going to be a repeat of that situation. But even if, even if it became very difficult to stay married, if my wife became an invalid or something or needed lots of care, you, you know, uh, I, or if I did, I mean, we have a, a vow we've made. And we've purposed in our hearts we're going to keep that loyalty to each other because that's really what marriage is. People have lost sight of that fact in our society. People divorce over the slightest things, even the most vague things. You know, I don't feel like he was meeting my needs. I felt like I was e emotionally abused, whatever that means. I mean, he didn't smile enough or what? I mean, that's very vague things. I mean, there are some very specific things that the Bible mentions that could justify divorce in extreme situations, but those are very specific, and even in those cases, I think every Christian should have it in their heart purpose that I'm not going to be the one to break this marriage up. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure this does not happen, that I give no basis for it, because that's standing by principle. It's more convenient to get out of a marriage when it's difficult. It's more convenient to back down on a promise that you've made. A lot more convenient. But if you've purposed in your heart, it's like you've set your heart in like flint. You know, that, that term is used of Jesus in Luke chapter 9. It says he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem to be crucified. Now, flint, that's a strange, a strange uh, phrase. He set his face like flint. Flint is really hard mineral, really hard stone, unbreakable, un, un, inflexible. And Jesus set his face or his purpose to go to Jerusalem, and he knew that every single day as he anticipated the cross, there would be the temptation to, to leave the country or to do, go to safety. Mm -hmm. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was probably, at least momentarily, a temptation to call for those 12 legions of angels that he said were available to him. But he wouldn't do it. He had set his face like a flint. I'm not, this is unwavering. This is inflexible. Now, it might not seem... Like being inflexible is a very commendable thing. People commend the ability to be flexible. And we should be flexible about things that, are, that don't matter much. Um, you know, that is to say that aren't moral issues. That, that you know, who cares? Uh, no, no one is wrong. Even God is not wrong by you doing a certain thing or changing your mind about a certain thing because it's not a, not a moral issue, not a spiritual issue. But... On things that are moral issues, we should be absolutely inflexible. You know, I, uh, when, I, when I first started teaching uh, overseas for this organization called Youth of the Mission that I sometimes teach for, I remember I met a guy, a leader of one of the schools in New Zealand, actually, where I was going to teach the following week. I arrived the day early and was getting to know him. And 
And he used a phrase I'd never heard before, but I liked it. He said, you know, what I, what I find is I, we need more clean conscience Christianity. And I'd never heard anyone use that term, clean conscience Christianity, but I certainly knew instantly what he meant. Because we were talking about someone who had been uh, a Christian that he had known who had who'd divorced their wife and fallen away from the Lord and gone off back to the world. And, and it's in that context he's talking about the need for clean conscience Christianity. What, the, what clean conscience means is not just that you can look back at your past and you didn't do anything wrong so your conscience is clear, but it means that you're living with a determination to keep your conscience scrupulously clean. This is much more important biblically than perhaps some, some of our preachers and teachers have indicated. Let me show you something. Uh, in 1 Timothy. Come on. All right. <clears throat> Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, Verse 5, now the purpose of the commandment, and by this he means of the commandment that he's given to Timothy. There are some translations that say the purpose or the goal of our instruction is. He's saying this is really the goal I'm teaching you to embrace. This is, the, this is what I'm hoping to result from my writing to you. The goal of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience and from sincere faith. Now, the one goal, he said, is love. But that love comes from, it comes from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. We all know that the one obligation that Jesus said we have, that everyone will know us by, is our love. He said, this is how all men will know you're my disciples, if you love one another. So love is the big, the big duty. And, but this love comes from keeping a pure heart, a good conscience. That would be an undefiled conscience. And sincere faith. Now what's an, an undefiled conscience? Well, you know, the conscience is not actually a thing. There's not an organ in your body that is your conscience that could possibly be taken out by a surgeon. Your conscience is a capacity, a, a moral and spiritual capacity that we have, which apparently other animals don't have. It is probably part of what is meant when God said, let us make man in our own image. I think there's kind of a cocktail of features that are part of the image of God in man, rationality being among them, free will probably being another one, uh, a conscience being another one, knowing right from wrong. The, the word conscience simply means that capacity to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Every human being, except possibly a sociopath, who has numbed his conscience, has seared his conscience, as Paul sometimes uses the term, uh, cauterized it and made it insensitive, every human being has a sense of right and wrong. Now that doesn't mean they all know what's right and wrong. There are some people in our society who think that uh, same-sex marriage is right. Well, obviously, that's not what the Bible teaches, but people often think that's right. They have a sense of right and wrong. They just have wrong, they're just mistaken about the categories, you know? Mm -hmm. There is actually even a, a very strange tribe spoken of uh, by Don Richardson in his book, uh, Lords of the Earth, I think it was in that book, uh, where he was a missionary in Irian Jaya, which is the other part of the island of Pap Papua New Guinea, a very you know, cannibalistic uh, tribal region. And he was a missionary there for a long time. He said there was a tribe there, he told about, who they actually thought that everything that we think is good, they thought was bad, and everything that we think is bad, they thought was good. They had had no contact with the Western world or Christianity at all. But they thought, for example, one of the highest virtues was treachery. When they heard the gospel for the first time, they thought Judas was the hero. And they thought Jesus was the schmuck. They thought Jesus was the one who was, you know, you know, he, he, was, he, did, he was faithful and trusting and, and vulnerable and loving. And they thought that those are all undesirable traits. I mean, these people were really 
turned upside down. I mean, when Isaiah said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, uh, I don't know if even Isaiah knew anyone who was this turned around, where everything that is considered morally good they thought was commendable, or bad, they thought was bad, and everything morally evil is commendable. But the point is, some would say, well, see, those people didn't have an innate conscience of right and wrong. They sure did. They just had it all mixed up. They still knew some things are right and some things are wrong. If you meet somebody who, who doesn't appear to have a conscience, and they say there are no absolute morals, you know, I can go out and I can, you know, take advantage of people, I can, you know, I could rape women, I could, I could rob, I could do, there's no real right and wrong. Well, they certainly know there's right or wrong when you do something to them. You go into their house and take their stereo without permission, they'll certainly immediately show that they, they definitely have very strong feelings about the existence of right and wrong. Just because people are very poorly informed about what goes in what category, right and wrong, it doesn't mean that they don't have a strong sense that there are some things right and some things wrong. That's a sense that animals don't seem to have, and certainly plants don't. So it would appear to be something of the nature of God, the image of God, built into human beings, that we have a conscience. And conscience is just a word that's used for that capacity. It means consciousness of right and wrong. And again, the Bible talks about it, and we talk about people having or not having a conscience. We're not talking about some organ of the body that can be identified by a, a doctor, but we're actually talking about uh, our capacity of the spiritual life that we recognize right and wrong. And Paul said that we have to have a good conscience. If we're going to have love, it's got to be out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a, a sincere faith. Now, although the, the conscience isn't a literal organ, many times things that are spiritual can be spoken of by, by the analogy of physical organs, like the heart. The Bible's continually talking about a hard heart or a soft heart or a generous heart, or some other, but the heart is actually literally a, an organ of the body, but it's not really talking about that. That's a metaphor. But, but there is something in the internal life of a human being analogous to a heart, analogous to the heart. It's the center and core of your life and the, and the essence of your life, and it can be hardened, it can be softened, and so forth. Likewise with the conscience. Uh, the conscience can be, as Paul put it, seared. Uh, he, he talks about that also later to Timothy. He talks about these people who have a seared conscience, or the word seared is an older word for cauterized. You know what cauterized means. I'm sure everyone knows what that means. Uh, if you get badly wounded out in the bush and you need, you know, stitches, but you don't have any needle or thread, uh, and you're going to bleed to death or something, uh, you can always take a, you know, a red hot stone from the fire and just put it right on that wound, and it cauterizes it. It like instantly closes it up. It, it's an instant cure, but it's got its consequences. Um, I mean, it hurts for one thing, but that's not the consequences I'm thinking of. Once it's been cauterized, you've got scar tissue there, and it's not sensitive. Your nerves have been burned. They've been burned to bits. They're not really going to provide any service there anymore. And so what cauterization does is creates instantaneous scar tissue which is a good thing to have rather than having all, all of your blood bleed out. Better to have scar tissue. Uh, but if your heart is cauterized, if your conscience is cauterized, that means it's, it's lost its feeling. I think a cauterized conscience, probably the same thing Paul had in mind in Romans 1 when he talked about God giving people over to a reprobate mind. Uh, a mind that no longer seems to have a, a conscience functioning. It's an injured conscience, and it's a defiled conscience, but it's, uh, it's not aware of it, because its sensitivity is no longer there. It's been seared. It's been cauterized. It's been desensitized. And that's a really, really bad place to get to. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, where Paul's talking about they knew God, but they didn't honor him as God, and they didn't glorify him as God, and so God gave them over to their own lusts, and then they kept doing bad things, so he gave them over to more depraved kind of lusts, and then they kept doing bad things, so therefore he gave them over to a reparate mind. Mm -hmm. And once they get to that, it's like, that's like the last step down to uh, you know, oblivion, spiritual oblivion. You know? 
Uh, a, a reprobate mind is, uh, many, many commentators would say, it means one that's incapable of approving good or evil. It's what we might call a sociopath, somebody who just doesn't care about whether something's right or wrong, doesn't have any sensitivity about that at all. That's a place you don't want to get. When God gives you over to that, that's the ultimate in his wrath. You know, that whole, that whole progression in Romans 1 starts out by saying, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And he goes on to describe it. But what you say, well, where's the wrath of God? He says, the wrath of God is revealed. Where is it? Where is it revealed? In the hardness of heart that they've had. That's the wrath of God. He's turned them over. Mm -hmm. He's no longer going to convict them anymore. And by the way, to the sinner who doesn't want God, they might think, well, that's the best thing. Put me in that position as soon as possible. I'd love to get rid of all this conviction about what I'm doing. You know? I don't like feeling bad about what I do. Give me this hard heart. Well, the problem is, that's the worst thing that can happen to you. Once you no longer feel conviction, you can no longer be saved, it would appear. I mean, this is, I think, what Jesus talked about when he talked about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There's different views about this, but Jesus said, all sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That will not be forgiven men in this age or in the age to come. He says, if anyone speaks a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven him. But whoever speaks a word against the Holy Spirit, it will never be forgiven him. Now, some people call this the unpardonable sin. It's not an unpardonable sin per se. Jesus didn't say it's an unpardonable sin. He said, those who do it will never be forgiven. Now, is that because God sees the sin as unpardonable? Or is it that the person who reaches that point is unrepentable? I don't think there's any sin so great that God won't pardon it if a person can really repent of it. Jesus never said there's a sin that God won't forgive. He said there's some sins that when you do it, you won't get forgiven. And, and that's probably because your heart is no longer in the condition that it can do what's necessary to be forgiven. That's repent. You have to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You have to repent. If you don't get there, then you're not going to be forgiven. And I believe that there are, a person can take that course of life where they're, they're, they're being convicted about something. And they don't heed it. They, they don't heed their conscience. And the conviction c continues and they don't heed it. Eventually, it's not such a loud scream, the protest of the conscience. It gets down to a whisper until it can't be heard anymore. And I think it's like this. It's like when you learn to play the guitar. Um, anyone who even has tried to learn to play guitar knows. You take the first guitar home, get it out of the box, look at the chord book, okay, how do I make a D chord like that? And, oh, this hurts my fingers really bad, you know? Fingers weren't made to hold down steel strings like that. That's not what we're made for, are they? Are they? Well, who knows what they're made for? Fingers can do a lot of things that aren't comfortable, and eventually they get to a place where they're comfortable enough. If you keep trying to play the guitar in two or three days, you won't feel that anymore. Not because it isn't still the same injury to the fingers, but because your skin is so thick, you've got calluses. Your, your skin is desensitized. You're still doing the same injury to the, you know, creasing your fingers, but it doesn't hurt anymore because you become callous to it. Yeah. So how do we play that idea with the concept that, like, God hardens the heart? Well, God hardens people's hearts as an act of judgment mm -hmm. when, when he's done with them. That is, when, when they're not going to be saved anymore. We think of Pharaoh as the classic case. There are other... A few other cases in the Bible are mentioned of God hardening the hearts of people, but, um, but more often people are warned not to harden their own hearts. Do not harden your heart as in the day of provocation, you know. Uh, but what do we do with that? Well, Pharaoh, uh, unfortunately some people think that God just kind of picks people at random and hardens one and, and saves another. Uh, but that's not what the Bible says. God never took a baby and hardened that baby's heart. Uh, Pharaoh was not a baby when his heart got hardened. Pharaoh was a tyrant who killed people and, and abused slaves. He was a wicked man. Uh, he was a heartless man. And he was already a very hard individual. And God hardened his heart, meaning that God froze him in that position so that he would not come to his senses during the ten plagues. God wanted all ten of those plagues to come as a destruction upon Egypt. And that wouldn't happen if Pharaoh repented. So God's judgment on Egypt and Pharaoh and on the gods of Egypt, according to Exodus 12, was going to be through these ten plagues. Now, it wouldn't work if Pharaoh caved in and repented early. So God hardened his heart to prevent him from caving in so that the whole 
10 plagues would come. And that was the judgment that God did upon him because he already deserved it before the first time his heart was hardened. You see, when, if God has decided, I'm, you're so bad, I'm not, I'm not going to give you any more chances. There's a couple ways God could go. One is he can kill him right then. So I wouldn't have any more chances after that. Or he could say, I'm going to keep you alive long enough for me to use you to bring on your society the judgment I think is worth it. Then I'll kill you. you know? But during the time that I'm keeping you alive, your opportunity to repent is just as much revoked as if I killed you right at the beginning. You know? A person who God kills instantly doesn't have a chance probably to repent after that. So likewise, Pharaoh didn't have a chance to repent after a certain stage. The, the hardening of his heart and the hardening of a few other people to mention in the Bible's hearts is simply a judgment of God. But I don't think God has ever hardened the heart of anybody, well certainly he's never hardened the heart of anybody who hasn't already somewhat pursued a path of hardening. A person who's kept their conscience tender, a person who's trying to be obedient to God, you'll never find a case in the Bible where God takes someone who's really wanting to please God but God says, sorry, I predestined you to be hardened, so you, boom, you're hardened. That, that's not how God operates. You had your hand up. Yeah, I, I guess how I see it is not that God actually does something to take this person and harden their heart, but more that he steps back and allows their heart to go where it's going. He stops, he allows them to do what they want. They've shown and demonstrated through their actions in their life that they want nothing to do with mm -hmm. doing things the proper way and following God. And so he steps back and lets yeah, that would certainly be true. That certainly would be true of the case in Romans chapter one, because there it doesn't say that God uh, did anything except surrender them. He just did stopped interfering. He gave them up to do what they want to do. He gave them up to what the to the the way they were progressing. He doesn't stop them. And this is the interesting thing that when God stop decides not to stop you anymore, that's about the most wrathful thing he could do. The most merciful thing God can do is try to stand in your way and block your way like he did with the donkey that Balaam was riding. You know, the angel standing in the way, trying to block him, trying to block him. Uh, and, you know, every sinner at, you know, a certain point in their life is encountering God's roadblocks where he's saying, stop, don't go there. It's either in their conscience telling them, hey, I'm not doing the right thing. It's maybe hearing the gospel and being convicted that that's true. <laughs> Maybe it's a, a horrible accident they survive, and they say, wow, that was, that was a, sh a shot across the bow. I better get my life right. I mean, there's all kinds of points in a person's life where God is saying, you better stop here. Up, oh, further down the road, you better stop at least here. Up, oh, you're down here. Oh, you better stop at least here. Finally says, okay, bye. I'm not going to try to stop you anymore. And when he, do when he decides, I'm not going to convict you about this anymore. You have a good time because you're, you're going to need it because you're going to have a real bad time after this short time is done. I mean, when God says, okay, I'm not going to try to stop you anymore. I'll just let you do what you want to do. That could be seen as the ultimate judgment of the sinner. And that's what Paul calls the wrath of God revealed from heaven against ungodliness of men. But the point I wanted to talk about, I mean, this did get us off a little bit, but on a related topic, is that the conscience needs to be maintained inviolated. That is, you don't want to violate your conscience. And if you do, thank God that you still have one. Thank God that your conscience is still there protesting and that you still feel like that's the wrong thing because that's what brings you to repentance. It is actually the goodness of God that he gives you conviction about something that leads you to repentance. The goodness of God is to bring you to repentance, Paul said in Romans 2. So... Uh, having a conscience is good, but, you, but it's not guaranteed your conscience will always be there. And a person who wants to live in sin usually finds the conscience to be a pest. But a Christian who wants to live a holy life, although the conscience protests are not fun to endure, you can be thankful that they're there. If you say, at least I haven't totally lost all sensitivity yeah. to right and wrong. Thank God I still know what's wrong, what I'm doing, and leads you to repentance. And when you repent... Your conscience is cleansed. You know, the book of Hebrews talks about how the blood of Christ cleanses you from an evil conscience. That is, he, he purifies your conscience from bad behavior that you've done. That means that instead of being condemned by the accuser of the brethren, you overcome that accusation by the blood of the Lamb and by the fact that Christ cleanses your, you of those things that you've done that, that you're accused of. 
So you can live with a clear conscience even though you aren't perfect. But, but even though you're not perfect, as a Christian, you have principles that you want to perfectly fulfill. A violation of those principles does injure your conscience. And the best thing you can do is repent quickly because that means you keep your conscience healthy and active. Whereas if you don't repent, it's like playing the guitar. Your, str your fingers are protesting. This hurts, this hurts. You've got to stop. Give up this habit of playing the guitar. But as you keep doing it, they don't, they don't protest anymore. You've got calluses there. You don't feel it. Now, playing the guitar is not a bad thing to do. So enduring past the protests of your fingers is one thing. Calluses on your fingers are a good thing for a guitar player to have. But calluses on your conscience are really a, a bad thing to have. And so you don't want the, the protests of your conscience to become fainter and fainter in your ears. I remember R.C. Sproul telling about when he was young. I heard him tell this story on one of his recorded lectures. He said he was not a Christian until he was in college, but as a, as a teenager, he actually, he actually lost his virginity when I think he was about 15 or 16 years old. And he said it was the, the first time it happened. He was so sick with guilt that he went home and he threw up afterwards. But he said he kept doing it. And he said by the time he was 19 or 18 or whatever, he didn't feel a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Still did the same, still committed the same sin, didn't feel a thing about it, which is a, a terrifying example. When he was young enough to have his conscience active and alive, he knew that he'd done wrong. It really upset him. But you keep doing the wrong thing, and your conscience eventually says, okay, whatever, go ahead. It's like you reshape your conscience to approve what's wrong. Mm -hmm. You see, again, the conscience is not a physical object. It's more of a spiritual capacity, but it's like by the analogy of, of let's say, something like clay. Uh, the, the human conscience is not static, it's, it's dynamic. If you cultivate your conscience and protect your conscience and, and live by your principles, it's shaped, and it's, in, in a sense, it hardens into the shape you want it to be. Your principles become you. They be, uh, you choose your principles almost before you have them. When you first become a Christian out of a pagan life, you don't have godly principles. But now as a Christian, you need to choose God. Okay, I want to live a, a godly life in this, this, and this way. I need to stop doing this and this thing. I want to be different. Well, you're not instantly, you know, uh, governed by those principles, you know, without any effort. You have to... You have to keep stick to your gun and say, this is what I approve of. Even if I fail, if I stumble and I fall, well, everyone stumbles. In many things, we all stumble, James said. But if I get up again and say, I'm not going to let that stumbling become the norm. I'm not going to be okay with that, ever. You know, when your kid is learning to walk, it's not too surprising when a child takes a step or two the first day, first steps they take, and then they're down on the ground or they fall. Uh, but it's not okay for them to stay down. You don't say, okay, well, this is going to be the normal then for this kid's life. You know, he took a few steps, but he fell. So, you know, it's a lot easier to be down than up. So why don't we just, why don't we just call that normal? We'll let this kid, when he's 12 years old, still not know how to walk. No, you, no, you, you don't, you're not okay with stumbling. I, you recognize it's normative for someone just learning to walk, a child. But they're supposed to get better. And they only get better because they keep trying. A child is amazing how God has put an instinct in them. They want to walk upright. I don't know if it's because they're imitating the people around them or if it's just something instinctive. They just don't want to stay on all fours forever like other animals do. They want to get up on their feet. And, and so they want to walk. And if they fall down, uh, you know, a baby doesn't get too discouraged falling down. And you're not discouraged when they do it. But they're still doing it as much when they're five years old. You've got a problem. And... Uh, you know, as they get older, they become quite adept at walking. It, it becomes the new normal. And, uh, you know, when you get older, you don't fall down as much until you get about my age. <laughs> then you start falling down some more. But, uh, but the truth is that uh, it's like that with your conscience, with your principles. You adopt the principles. I'm going to walk according to these principles. And I'm not going to ever say that anything less than that is okay. 
I may succumb to temptation. I might stumble, but I'm not going to say that's okay. I, I'm not going to say, well, I guess I'm about normal. Everyone else is doing the same thing. I guess that's my new normal. I'm going to lower the bar to where I'm, you know, where I can just step over it instead of pole vault over it. You know that why? Why have the bar so high? I keep knocking it off the poles. You know, no, you don't lower the bar. The principles are the bar. And you say, okay, that's the, that's the principles. If you want to be an uh, Olympic pole vaulter, and I don't know much about what the records are, but you'd find out what, you know, what's the record? What's the highest anyone's ever gotten over that pole successfully? Okay, I'm going to go two inches higher than that, and that's going to be the bar I'm going to go for, and I'm not going to lower it. Because if I lower it, I can't ever win the gold medal. If I can get to the place where I can get over that, I can win the gold medal. But if, if, I, can, if I lower the bar, what, might as well not even be in the sport. There's nothing to aim at. There's, there, there's nothing accomplished if I get over a lower bar. That's not what it's about. It's about doing it perfectly. Now you might say, but nobody's perfect. True. Nobody but Jesus is perfect. But what goal other than per perfection can you settle for when you're aiming for you know what you want to be, you could. I mean, the Bible sets the, the the bar really high, and sometimes I used to wonder why does God set the bar so high when no one seems to really get over it. I mean, nobody is perfect. Yet you know, God keeps saying, you know, let us go on to perfection. Um, but I realized later that if He had set the bar lower, we might get over it and be content where we are. Right. You know, better to have a bar that we keep missing, but we're still aiming at than to lower the bar to what we already are able to do and say, oh, life is easy, you know. Of course, I'm not a very good person, you know. Of course, I fall all the time to temptations that good people shouldn't fall to. Of course, I'm not very much like Jesus. Uh, and you can read the lives of the saints and say, boy, those are great heroes. Too bad I can't be like that. Well, why can't you? They were human too. You're human. Hey, you have that in common. What don't you have in common? They had principles. They would die before they would violate their principles. And some of them did die because they would not do it. That's the only difference. And that's because, like Daniel, they had purposed in their heart not to defile themselves with the worldly things that we're not supposed to be defiled with. Now, again, uh, this is, I'm not teaching Christian perfection here because I, I'm not perfect. I don't think any of you are. And I don't think I've met anyone who is. Uh, and I frankly expect to die before I can call myself perfect. I don't think I'll live that long. But I'm sure not going to lower the bar. You know, it's a huge difference to stand before God and you say, well, why weren't you perfect exactly? I called you perfection. Why weren't you? If you say, hey, that was my goal every day in life. My goal in life is to be obedient to you, to be fruitful to be a loving Christian, to be, uh, you know, to live honestly and purely. That was my goal. I just was kind of weak, and many times I, I'm afraid I just stumbled. There's a difference between that and standing before God imperfect, and he says, why aren't you perfect? Oh, it never crossed my mind to want to be. Never made any effort at it. Never cared to, really. Oh, I'm supposed to do that? You know, wish someone had told me earlier. Because it's, it's a very easy thing, I think, for God to, perf to forgive imperfections when he knows that the heart of his child was aiming to please. Then to just overlook imperfection when his heart, the heart of the child was not even slightly interested in what God wanted. Just wanted to do their own thing. And yeah, both parties failed to be perfect. But one failed after making it their heartfelt goal. And so when we have our principles as Christians and, and, and are determined, I'm, I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to, and I don't want to tell you that I've always done this right. I'm a teacher. I'm not a Messiah. I, I ha, you know, how do you think I learned these things? I learned them by failing just like everyone else. But failing has never seemed to me like a good excuse to change the goalpost. You know, failing to get over the bar has never been seen by me as an excuse for lowering the bar. There's a, a certain integrity that I have to say, uh, I don't think I have a sinful pride about it. I honestly have never, I mean, I'm often aware of being proud, but I don't think I have a sinful pride about this particular thing, that I have a certain 
determination that I'll give up anything before I give up my integrity. My integrity is my honesty before God and man, my, uh, you know, the lack of, of hypocrisy. I mean, integrity is your character. And it's basically, integrity means you will stand by your principles rather than by convenience. And there's a great scripture about that, which I, which I brought up under other topics from time to time, and some of you may have heard me bring it up before. I love it. I, you can't bring it up too often. It's in, it's in uh, Psalm 15. Here's a description of a principled life of a godly person. A very short psalm, Psalm 15, says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Now, this question is asked by somebody who, David, who wants to dwell in the presence of God without interruption, without being debarred from God's presence. I want to stay here. I want to dwell here. I want to be in your holy hill where you are. I want to be in your house with you. I want unbroken fellowship with you. I want you to feel good about having me here in your home. Who, who is there that you would be glad to have in your house, Lord? And the answer is given strictly in terms of people who are principled with a conscience toward God. It says, he who walks uprightly, who works righteousness, who speaks the truth in his heart, that's integrity, who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money to usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Now, the question is, who can dwell unmoved? in the presence of God. Who can be there unashamed, unrestricted, have free access to dwelling in God's holy hill with him? Now he says, those who do these things will never be moved. What things? Well, a lot of them are pretty self-explanatory. One line in there is perhaps not that easy to understand by modern readers, but it's one of the great lines uh, in there. It says, it's uh, at the end of verse four, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. This is a very important character trait. What's it mean to swear to your own hurt and not change? Well, swearing, by the way, is a term we use these days almost usually only of profanity. You know, Christians don't smoke or drink or swear, right? I mean, when we say swear, we usually mean use bad words, cuss, or, or blaspheme, or something like that. Actually, the word swear in the Bible, I don't think, I'm not sure it ever had that meaning. Certainly not in the Old Testament. To swear always meant to take an oath, that is to make a promise, a solemn promise, to swear. And, and, and it says in Scripture, God even swore. He swore by himself. Now it says in Scripture in Hebrews chapter 6 that people always would swear by something greater than themselves. And God couldn't think of anything greater than themselves to swear by, so he swore by himself. But the idea of swearing was this, that today you and I, if we enter into a, 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 an agreement to buy a house or a car, uh, and we don't have cash for it, we have to sign a contract. Now that contract is there to keep us honest. If we don't p make the payments or don't do what we said, we'll go to court and we'll be penalized for it. They didn't have contracts like that as frequently because frankly, writing was more inconvenient back then. They didn't have paper. They didn't have easy access to pens. It was kind of a, a hassle to write. But they, they would swear. They'd say, I swear by God that I will meet the terms of this agreement. Now, you might say, well, you shouldn't swear by God. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. No, it isn't. It's only, in the Bible, it's only taking the name of the Lord in vain if you swear by God and you don't keep your oath. You're taking his name as that which affirms your honesty. The idea is, I know you don't know if you can trust me or not. I'm making a promise you don't know if I'm going to keep. So I will swear by something we both revere. I'll swear by the temple. I'll swear by the altar in the temple. I'll swear by the holy mountain of Jerusalem. I'll swear by God himself. And that was a way of saying, certainly you don't think I'm such a scoundrel 
that I would invoke the virtue of something so sacred and then violate my oath. And, and it would take truly someone who had no fear of God. And, you know, it says in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, be careful about making oaths before God. And when you make an oath, keep it, because God has no pleasure in fools. Better not make an oath than to make an oath and break it. The idea here is when you invoke anything in an oath, you're saying, you can trust me because I am putting my integrity on the, I'm putting God's own honor on the line to back up my integrity, basically. If I lie to you, I'm bringing God's character into disrepute, and believe me, I'm not that stupid. You know, I mean, basically that's the subtext of swearing something. In fact, God in, his, in, the, in, the, uh, in the law, he actually told the Israelites to swear by his name. In my name, you should take your oaths, he said, because he didn't want them swearing by other gods. It was he, you know, people who, who chose the most sacred thing they could imagine to swear by, well, that better be God. If you think something more sacred than him, you better not, better not uh, show God that you're doing so, because that's an insult to him. Now, this says, the man who swears to his own hurt. That means a person has made an oath that they'll do something, and now, what does it mean to his own hurt? It means it, it's hurting him to keep it. You often will make a promise that you didn't know would cost as much to keep as it ends up costing to keep. Like when you get married sometimes. And many of you know this. I'm not saying only unhappily married people, even happily married people know this. That when you get married to someone, you're marrying Prince Charming. You're marrying a princess. You're marrying the person who's gonna give you eternal bliss until you die. And uh, you know it's gonna be like uh, it's going to be a romantic uh, dream for the rest of your life because you're marrying the perfect woman and she's married the perfect guy. And yet that isn't really true. But no one knows how much that isn't true until after they start living together and, and so forth. And there are things that people find out about each other. How much the other snores, how much the other doesn't shower often enough or whatever. You, know, you find out stuff like that. You don't find out when you're dating. You find that out after you live with someone. And when people get married, they make an oath, such as I was talking about earlier. You know, this is for life, no matter what, for rich or for poor, for sickness or health. That's an oath I make in the name, usually if you have a Christian wedding, it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's an oath taken in the name of God. And yet, how many people who've taken those oaths, you meet them 10 years later, 20 years later, they're not married anymore. What happened? Well, you know, she was really hard to live with. But he didn't meet my needs. Uh, you know, he, he never really had much ambition. I knew I could do better. I mean, things like that come up and you think, wait a minute, didn't you swear? Yeah, but it, I didn't know. When I swore, I didn't know it was gonna be that hard. Well, then you, you mean you swore to your own hurt. Swearing to your own hurt means you made a promise to do something that you didn't know was gonna hurt as much to keep as it does. Now, the person that God honors is the person of integrity, which, among other things, he swears to his own hurt, but does not change, says he does not back down. He doesn't say, oh, I didn't know this would be this hard. I think I'm going to back out of this one, thanks. Uh, I'm not going to do this. You don't expect me to keep my oath when it's difficult, right? And that's, but the person says, I will not violate my principles, my integrity. I, I swore I'm going to do it. And I, I mean, that's exactly the principle and the, idea that I had in my mind when I said I would not divorce my first wife despite the fact that I felt like I even had grounds to. I said I would not. That's my principles. And I swore it at the altar and I will not violate that no matter how much it's to my own hurt to keep it. That's, that's caring about your integrity. I used to, uh, I, I give these examples quite a bit because they were instances where this verse actually instructed me. And so when I think of this verse, I think of these cases. Um, I used to run a discipleship school in Santa Cruz, California. It was only in the summers. So I couldn't maintain a property year-round because I only had school in the summers. The other nine months, I certainly couldn't afford to maintain a property empty for nine months. I didn't have any money anyway. I mean, the students would pay a minimal amount, and we'd take the sum and pay rent on a facility for 12 weeks, and I'd, we'd have a discipleship school there. Did this for three different years, but three different locations. 
in Santa Cruz, California. And one year, a summer was coming because we held these in the summer. And I was looking for a place to rent for the school. And I found out a guy in our, in our church was going to Hawaii. He owned a house. He wanted to rent out his house. I thought, maybe it'll do. I went and looked at the house. It was kind of good. It wasn't really quite as much as I needed, but I could, I could squeeze people into it and do it. I could make it work. So I said, okay, because I wasn't sure anything else was going to come up. I said, okay, I'll rent the house starting in June. He said, fine, this was probably in March. So there a few months ago. Well, shortly after that, I found another property. It was less expensive and much more suited. It had two buildings on one property with a courtyard in between, and it was, an, it was just right for what we had to do. We had to house students, we had to have classes, we had to feed them, and so forth. And this, this was just a much more perfect setup. I thought, I went back to my friend and said, you know, Larry, I said I'd rent your house, but I found another place that's really better. Uh, it'll suit me much better. So uh, I can't afford to rent it and yours, so I'd like it if you'd let me out of my commitment to rent your house. And he said, well, listen, brother, I was counting on you. You said you'd rent my house, and I've had people want it, and I turned them away. I told them it was already committed. He says, I, you know, I'll be up the creek without a paddle if you don't rent my house, so I'm kind of hoping you'll keep your word. I said, okay, if you feel like it, if, if that's how you feel like it. I'll rent your house, even if I don't use it, because I'm, I'm going to use the other one. I'm going to rent the other one. I have no idea how I will afford to rent your house, too, but I know God will bless my choice to keep my word. So I said, I did promise I'd rent your house. If I don't rent it, it'll inconvenience you. You have every right to hold me to my word, so I will rent your house. But if you have someone come up who wants it, just tell them it's available. And fortunately, someone did, so I didn't have to rent his house. But I was determined I was going to rent his house and just leave it empty, because it was across town from a place I really wanted to use. I was going to definitely rent it. But I, I just remember thinking, he said, you said you'd do it. And if, if anyone ever tells me, you said you'll do this, they've got me. Yeah. <laughs> they've got my conscience. Yeah. The, the hook is there. I those dance lessons? <laughs> 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 my wife thinks I promised before we got married that we'd take dance lessons. <laughs> we haven't done that yet. So. <laughs> I told you I still will. I didn't say how soon. You didn't say when. <laughs> Someday. I've not forgotten. But it's uh, another instance of that was when I was, uh, uh, some of the time, I've been in the ministry for 50 years, but s the first 12 years of that, I sometimes had to work part time to support myself because I wasn't in full time ministry during those first 12 years. And, so I, I often supported myself by washing windows, just freelance. I'd go knock on doors, find people who want their windows washed, and agree to a price and do it for them. I, I, made okay, I made out okay doing that. And I remember I was in the Santa Cruz at the time, this time too, and in the Santa Cruz Mountains, there's a lot of you know, nice wood homes in the forest and stuff, and, I, and with cathedral ceilings and you know, high windows and stuff. And I was looking at this one house, and they were interested in having their windows washed, and I said, I'll do this for... Uh, $50. Now, today, $50 doesn't sound like, but it was 1974. I mean, to me, $20 was a good day's wage. So, I mean, $50 was really good. Um, and I said, I'll do this for 50 bucks. And they said, fine. I, so I showed up the next day with an extension ladder that I had to borrow because it had really high windows. And when I got there, I found out that the side of the house the windows were on was only about, I mean, I hadn't calculated, it was only about three feet from where the mountain drops off very suddenly. Now, there are a lot of trees growing out of the side of the mountain, so I was able to straddle the ladder around the trunk of a tree. Uh, the, the bottom two, you know, the bottom rung and the legs were straddling uh, uh, a fir tree uh, or a, some kind of a pine tree or something uh, that was growing out the side of a steep mountain. And, and the ladder was just not quite high enough. I actually had to get on the top rung, which you're not supposed to do, and reach over my head. I'm on this, I'm probably 20 feet up in the air, and I'm on the top rung of a ladder, nothing to hold on. I'm trying to get my squeegee, and it turns out these windows on high, they had, they had sprayed the house to weather seal it. And spray had gotten on the windows and hardened. So I had to actually use a razor blade, not a squeegee, mm -hmm. on those whole thing. And I'm here standing on top of a ladder, and I think this is going to take forever. It's going to take me days just to do these windows here, if I survive it. 
You know, if I would fall off that ladder, I would not just fall to the bottom of the ladder. There's a long hill. Who knows how far I'd be going before I stopped rolling. Uh, it, was, it was very dangerous as far as I was concerned. I realized I hadn't really figured on this being the case. Now, I remember as I was doing it, I was very unhappy. And I remember thinking, I, I, should, just tell, I should just tell them I, I, I underbid this job. I, it just, there's, this is crazy. This is no way going to be worth it to me, the, the amount of money we agreed on. And I, and I was trying to talk myself into doing that. But I kept hearing this one, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. I thought, you know, what's more important to me, making money on this job or getting out of it with my integrity? And there's never been any, I don't even have to think twice to answer that question. There's no price that a Christian should accept in exchange for their integrity. And so I finished the job and got the 50 bucks. I don't even think they tipped me. But the, that's okay. I, I, I did what I agreed to, you know. And uh, if you're going to have Christian principles, your principles have got to include several things. I'll just go over them real quickly because we're about out of time. But Jesus said these are the weightier matters of the law. If you look at Matthew 23... Jesus was castigating the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. And in verse 23, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done and not leave the other undone. Now, he said there's two kinds of laws. And you guys are pretty careful about the kind that doesn't matter as much. You're very careful about tithing, which supports the Levites for the priesthood and so forth, and the temple worship. And that's a good thing. You shouldn't leave that undone, he said. But it's a relatively small duty compared to much weightier matters. There are weightier matters of the law. A lot of times we are very careful to, to follow the religious duties that aren't very difficult to do. Attend church regularly, faithfully, give your tithe, or whatever, whatever it is that you're <coughs> expected to do. Those are kind of easy things to do. It's amazing when I find people who find even those are hard. Mm-hmm. But those are, the, those are the, really the easy things to do. That's, there are weightier things than that. There are weightier duties than that, Jesus said. Weightier matters of the law. He said what they are are justice and mercy and faithfulness. Now, these are more like principles than there's no command well, there, technically there is a command to, to, to do justly in the law, but the point is, this is more, these are more categories rather than specific commandments because many of the commandments basically boil down to being just or merciful or faithful. Certainly the law against adultery is saying you should be faithful. The law that says you should keep your oath to the Lord, that's about being faithful. Uh, many, uh, you know, being faithful means honest. Being faithful means trustworthy, having integrity, justice, and mercy. These are broader principles, but they are the kinds of things that become the principles of a principled man or woman. I will not do an injustice to another person. That's one of my principles. What does that mean, do an injustice? It means if someone has a right to something, I will not trample that right. If they have a right to be paid by me for something they've done, I'm going to make sure they get paid by me. If they have a right for, you know, to be a, a, to my respect, I'll make sure they have my respect. To make sure that you do not violate somebody's rights to their property, to their life, to their reputation. These are the very, this is the very essence of you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. These are, these are laws embodying justice. When somebody has a right to something, you better not violate it because that's an injustice on your part. Injustice means giving someone what they deserve or what they have a right to. Now, mercy is giving someone something beyond what they deserve in a good way. They may not, the, the, the beggar who's very poor may not deserve your money because he hasn't earned it. You deserve your money. You earned it. But for you to give it over to him, you're extending to him a right that he doesn't naturally have to that particular coin anyway. Uh, 
When you forgive somebody, you're doing something they do not innately deserve. In fact, you deserve to retaliate. There's, there's a certain justice in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus said, how about if you don't do that? How about if someone strikes you instead of striking them back, which would be justice enough because they deserve it. But how about if you just turn the other cheek? If they deserve to make you go one mile, why don't you go two? You know, if they deserve and they're trying to sue you for your cloak, how about you give them that and give them your coat also? In other words, give them what they don't deserve in a good way, in addition to making sure you don't violate what they do deserve. Justice, the principle of justice in your life is where you say, I will never violate another person's legitimate rights. Now, sometimes people think they have the rights to think that they don't have any right to, and of course that, has to, that takes some thinking through. But once you have understood what a human's rights are, that you will never trample those rights or violate those rights is your principle of justice. I will be a just person. I will be a merciful person, which means that to the extent that I'm able, I will extend to others benefits that they don't have any innate right to, but what they need. Mercy is extended on the basis of need, not right. God forgives us, not because we have the right to be forgiven, but because we need to be forgiven. We give to the poor not because they deserve it, but because they need it. Mercy is response to need, whereas justice is response to rights and entitlements. And again, like I say, in our age, people think they have more entitlements and rights than they legitimately do. But people do have some rights. I've heard some Christians say, well, no, you're a Christian, you're dead. Dead men have no rights, so you have no rights. It's not exactly what the Bible teaches. It does say, in a sense, we're dead, but it doesn't connect that with the rights. What it does, if I have no rights, let's just say you have no rights, then there'd be nothing wrong with me taking your car, going, you know, joyriding without your permission. Because I, you don't have any more right to that car than I do, right? But you do. You bought the car. You own the car. I don't own it. You've got rights to your property that I don't have to your property. I can't go into your house and just raid your refrigerator without being invited. You own that stuff. Now, it may well be true that you have rights, but mercy is when you voluntarily give up your rights. I have the right to my privacy, but this homeless person maybe, I mean, I'm not trying to advocate bringing homeless people in your house because I don't think most homeless people are, have a legitimate reason for being homeless, honestly. But the point is, there are places where people are truly uh, and legitimately poor, and they don't have any right innately to your assistance but they need it, and you extend it. You give up your rights in order that they, their needs can be met. Uh, and then the, you know, justice and mercy and faithfulness, these are the principles that Jesus says are the weightier matters of the law. What is faithfulness? Like I said, being trustworthy. You say it, if you say it, people can count on it. You're gonna do it. You swear to your own hurt, you don't change. You make promises, you keep the promises. You don't even make promises, you just say yes, and it's yes, or no, and it's no. You don't even have to use oaths. Jesus said, don't even use the oaths. Just say yes and mean yes. Be so honest, be so faithful that even if you don't take an oath, people can count on you keeping your word because you're a principled person. You've got character. You're maintaining a clean conscience before God. Let me just show you one other verse from Paul and then we'll just call that quits here. Um, we'll take a break before I bring something else up here. In 1 Timothy 1, we were looking at that chapter earlier, but not this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Remember, it was in that chapter that Paul said the, the goal of our instruction is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and so forth. Later on in the same chapter, in 1 Timothy 1, he says uh, in verse 18 and following... This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning their faith, have suffered shipwreck. Now, he wants you to wage the good warfare because you're going to wage warfare whether you do it well or not. This is a war zone we're living in. There's an enemy. You are under attack, by the way. And, and you should let the enemy know he's under attack. 
too, by the way. This, is a, too, this war goes both ways, but we're, we're the aggressors. Jesus is the one who has said, all the nations, go make disciples of all the nations. They're mine now. All authority in heaven and earth is mine. We're the ones who have the commission to go out and take the territory from the enemy. So we're the aggressors here. But the truth is the devil puts up a fight. And sometimes if we're sitting idle and stupid, he'll, he'll be the aggressor for the moment. He'll come after you. You're in a warfare. How are you going to fight successfully a good warfare? Well, first of all, you've got to have faith and a good conscience. I'll tell you, if your conscience isn't good, the devil's got nine-tenths of the victory over you. That's why he's the accuser of the brethren. That's the best way for him to beat you, is to accuse you and make your conscience hurt. Because you'll have no confidence toward God. You need to have confidence toward God. And you can't if you feel like, I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm, I'm not right with God. If you, it's when you have clear conscience. Like it says uh, uh, in, uh, I guess it's 1 John 5, 14. He says, this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And it's not there, but it's also in 1 John that he talks about if our, it's in chapter 3, he says, if our, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence toward God, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things pleasing in his sight, it says. So if we keep our hearts clean, if our hearts don't condemn us, if our conscience is clear, we have confidence toward God. That devil doesn't want that. And what we ask, we receive. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things pleasing in his sight. Now you might say, but I thought this is all about you know, justification by faith. Yeah, the getting justified is by faith. There's no question about it. But being saved isn't only being justified, it's also being sanctified and eventually glorified. Salvation's a bigger picture than just making sure you have a ticket to heaven. Once you're saved, the question is, now what does God have in mind? He has in mind for you to overcome, overcome sin in your life. And that's going to take some resolve. That's going to take some warfare. That's going to take some effort, like, like a runner who disciplines himself in all things, Paul said. You know, there's a, it's interesting how Paul talks so much about we're saved by faith, not by works. It's all by grace. But then he's always talking about being like an athlete, you know, you know restricting yourself in all things and running hard, being like a soldier, enduring hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and fight the warfare and run the good race. That's a lot of exertion he's talking about. Yeah, well, anyone who's tried to live a Christian life knows there is a great deal of exertion involved. Yeah. Fortunately, because of the grace of God, your success is not what your acceptance by God is based upon. You're accepted in Christ. But having been accepted, there's still something for you to do. My children were accepted by me, not because they obeyed me. They're accepted because they're my children. But they're expected to obey me. Right? I mean, their children kind of is part of their part of the definition. Obey your parents, okay? So, my children were born with an obligation to obey, but their their status as children was not based on their obedience. No matter how much they disobey, they're still my children. But they have they're supposed to obey, and we are saved by grace, but we are expected to obey. We're expected to fight and win the warfare. We're expected to run the good race. We're expected to hold to our principles, to be obedient unto death and faithful unto death. So this, these are the principles that I'm afraid some people, when they become Christians, it never even crosses their mind that they now are expected to live mm -hmm. radically differently than when they were just kind of cruising through life and choosing their own way. Mm -hmm. No, you come after each, you said you deny yourself, you take up a cross. You follow me? This is not the easiest road. It's, it's the only road that's worth taking. And that's why it's not easy, because things that are worthwhile cost something. And uh, if you don't ha have any, if it doesn't cost you anything, you're not offering anything of value to the Lord. Like David said, I will not offer the Lord something that costs me nothing. And we should recognize there's gonna, it's going to cost us something to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And that's what we're called to do. And that requires that we attend to our character, that we attend to our conscience, that we attend to our principles as Christians, which are justice and mercy and faithfulness. That's at least the beginning of a good list. There's other things you can add to that, like self-control, humility, to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with God is also another list in Micah 6.8. But the point is there's, 
certain principles. These are not laws, specific commands. They're more like themes. They're more like character traits. They're principles that the Christian says, this is where I stand. This is what I will adhere to. It may cost me my life. It may inconvenience me terribly. It might consign me to an unhappy marriage for the rest of my life. Who knows? It might consign me to poverty or prison if I hold up to my principles. So what? Life is short. Eternity is long. And uh, in this life, Paul said we suffer but for a moment. But it works for us in the eternal weight of glory. So I guess that's all I have time. Actually, I didn't even have time to say that because I've gone over time. So <laughs> let's just not uh, be so unjust as to presume on your time more than this. We'll take it. We'll call that quits on this. If you have any questions.